So today we're here with Alex Andahar, the rector of St. Vincent's Episcopal Church in St. Petersburg, Florida, and author of a new pamphlet from Forward Movement called Retelling the Story, the Birth of Jesus, and illustrator Everett Patterson from Portland, Oregon, who has created an amazing illustration and cover of Jose and Maria. And they, we are here talking with them today about their work and what they hope will inspire and challenge and ultimately help people um, move deeper into their relationship with Christ. Welcome, Everett. Welcome, Alex. Hi, good to be here, Rochelle. It's just a, a, it's an honor and a privilege to be working with Forward Movement, especially with, with Everett and his, his wonderful artistic skills to um, be a part of continuing to reach people for Christ. Yeah, as I was saying before the call, I, I haven't yet read Alex's writing, but I can't wait to see um, how it explores and teases out these ideas. Great, thank you. Yeah. I'm so excited that the two of you are talking and um, so grateful for your, um, Alex's vision for this and then Everett's willingness to share his excellent illustration. Absolutely. That, uh, and I want to thank, it, so. I thank you personally for that. Thank you. And uh, I'm sorry to say, uh, Alex, that I, I have not read your writing yet. If there's an essay or a story accompanying this, uh, I haven't seen it yet, but, uh, but I look forward to it. Well, good. I think, I think Forward Movement may be publishing it soon. Okay. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's at the printer right now. So as soon as it is, um, as soon as it is printed, we'll send you some copies. And is it a, is it fiction or is it an essay? How, what's the format of what you wrote? Um, essentially, it's um, a reimagining of the, the the story of Jesus's birth, but in a modern context. You know, kind of the what if it was happening today? Um, what would it look like? What would it sound like? Um, which is why your illustration is so on point, um, because it it places you know uh, Joseph and Mary as Jose and Maria, um, mm -hmm. you know, in our in our modern time. Cool. And and but you wrote it as like a as like a piece of creative fiction rather than as like. Right, and, and uh, initially when I wrote it, there was a, a little bit longer of a piece uh, in front of it um, to make it kind of more of a, also a teachable uh, moment discussing, um, you know, why did God choose this? Oh, you know, right. Jesus could have come in any way, shape or form or anything. Mm -hmm. um, why was this the desired way? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and what are the implications of that? Mm -hmm. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, Alex, when you were thinking about this story and reimagining the birth of Jesus, why you use uh, Latino American um, characters? Why did you write it from that experience? What was um, so important to you to choose uh, Jose and Maria as the um, <clears throat> modern day Jesus or Joseph and Mary? Um, I think for me, you know, one of the things that I try to be in, in, my, in my writing, and, you know, we, we, we sometimes uh, cringe at words that are overused, um, but just trying to be authentic. Um, I, I can't write uh, from experiences that I don't know or from a cultural background that I don't have. Um, you know, I, I am Latino, and I, I began to wonder if I were to tell this story to my children or to try to relate this story to the Hispanic communities where I, where I live and work, what would it sound like to them? You know, if I told them a story about people who were the least of these, um, people who were in poverty, who were searching for a way to fulfill God's will uh, in the context of just trying to get somewhere and, and, and trying, like I said, to fulfill God's will. So. Uh, I live in the U.S. I am Latino, so I kind of thought first and foremost from that context. And Everett, you also, in your illustration, mm -hmm. Jose and Maria, you also used Latino um, depictions. So what was your motivation? Um, I think in my own case, uh, I'm being white, the, the first motivation was for it to be a modern setting. Uh, and, and then their ethnicities kind of same, came as a second afterthought, although not purely an afterthought. Like, um, I was still, it was 2014 when I drew the illustration, and I was uh, 
nervous at what seemed like then as a riding, a rising tide of sort of xenophobia in the U.S. and, and in Europe. And uh, of course, actually, four years later, it hasn't gotten any better. Um, <laughs> but, but at the time, uh, I was like, oh, man, uh, just remember, you know, uh, Jesus's parents were shortly after he was born, you know, refugees uh, in, in Bethlehem. They were not in their hometown. So, uh, you know, I was thinking kind of about what was already being called refugee crisis and the general immigration situation. Um, so that was probably why, why I chose to make them Latino. So uh, one of the questions, um, I think often there are people who have kind of this middle class white perspective of Joseph and Mary and maybe whitewash it a little bit. Um, how did, how were you trying to shake that perspective or, or push people into imagining this story in a more mm. accurate way? Yeah, I think so. Um, although it's funny that you would kind of say accurate, because the real Joseph and Mary were no more, uh, you know, American sure. Latinos than they were white Europeans. Right. Um, I think what I was thinking most about was medieval art and medieval depictions of mm -hmm. the Holy Family. Um, medieval history was kind of what I had studied before I became an artist. And uh, when you look at Bible art from that period, on one level, you want to laugh because it's so terribly inaccurate. You know, Jesus is walking through the Black Forest and he looks like a, um, you know, a medieval European and the Nebuchadnezzar's palace looks like a stone castle. And uh, it's just full of all these inaccuracies. And then, you know, later in later art, 19th, 20th century, for sure, there came to be this push towards historical accuracy. And, oh, we're going to use the archaeology and the historical understanding to depict these people closer to how they really would have looked in the first century. Mm -hmm. Try to understand that world. So something for sure was gained there. But I also think something was lost. Because for the medieval Christian artist, um, he was for sure acting from a point of view of ignorance about the past. But he was also emphasizing the continuity of the story with his own life in the present day. And he reads the Bible and he reads these stories about oppressive kings, or he reads these stories about people traveling long distances on foot. And he or she says, that's just like my life today in the 11th century or the 13th century, you know? And, uh, and so the, you know, it's easy to laugh at like the inaccuracies in medieval art, but it was also, they saw the story as like part of their own life, as like our world and this world are not that different. It might as well have been a European castle. So to, to do this illustration, which was originally my Christmas card, mm -hmm. um, I was thinking, you know, oh, um, you know, how, how would we get that back if we were to say, just for the moment, throw historical accuracy out of the window. Don't try to draw the robes and the sandals, because we've seen that stuff in Hollywood a lot. Um, what, what would it look like if we considered the story as alive today to us? And so we used modern stuff. What I love about this conversation, Alex and Everett, is that I, it seems like that motivation is what drew both of you independently. And then mm -hmm. we kind of found each other, both in the illustration and in the words and in the story. Alex, how, um, how do you respond to what Everett was saying? And um, do you think, how do you think, um, Jesus and Maria and Joseph would be, uh, Jesus and Mary and Joseph would be received t in today's climate if the situation was the same. You know, I think the interesting thing is, um, and, and um, for, the, for the sake of length, you know, some of the, the aspects of, of what I wrote kind of had to be condensed so that it didn't take away from the focus, which is the, the, the creative fiction part. Um, but one of the things I mentioned is that Oftentimes in the Christian tradition, we try to sanitize things as much as possible. And I look, for example, at Christmas and Advent. And, you know, I love Christmas plays. I love that my kids get in them. You know, I was a, a, a shepherd forever until I finally got promoted as a kid to being one of the three kings and my mom went all out, you know. Right, right. Um, but if we're not careful, we can really sanitize it. And what I mean by that is we can diminish just how powerful 
what's happening is. You know, so for example, think of the suffering that Mary endured on that journey. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I have two children. Um, I remember my wife's pregnancies very clearly. Um, she won't let me forget. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, and just realizing the suffering she went through, I can't imagine the journey that Mary went through, for example. Right. Um, I, I can't imagine what it must have been like to be disappointed and disheartened to know that as a parent, you have all this wonderful <sighs> thought about how your first child is going to come into the world. And then this is what happens to us. Mm-hmm. Um, the other part of it, though, in asking about how Mary and Joseph would be received today, or if, if you know, as Jose and Maria, I would say that humanity has a terrible track record of receiving Christ. And so pick any time period, pick almost pretty much any context, and we're going to probably find a a very efficient way to reject Christ coming into the world. And the reason I think that is, is is one of the things I wrote, which says Christ didn't come in lavish robes and a beautiful uh, palace. You know, he doesn't come and announce everything on, on Twitter and say, you know, join me for my live event of my birth. You know, he doesn't do any of those things. He comes in great humility. He comes in poverty. He comes unknown. And that's not what our world values. Our world values notoriety, the the look at me culture. Um, and, And so, and it's not to be completely critical of all of us, but it's just this understanding of, I think Jesus would be rejected everywhere. Mm -hmm. And it would be very hard, um, even for for those of us who believe and profess belief in him, um, to accept that as well. Yeah, I think that's a great point, um, Alex, about the humility of the circumstances. Uh, it's It's not like some accidental set dressing of the story. Like, here's what happened. Oh, and by the way, they were poor. Uh, it, it's an integral part of of the incarnation narrative, you know. On the back of the Christmas cards, when I printed them with the illustration, it was the verse from Philippians, um, you know, though he was equal with God, he didn't regard equality with God as something to grasp, but he humbled himself and took the form of a servant, being born in human likeness. So, like, just becoming a human was an act of humility for God. Um right. And then so much more a step further to be, like you said, the least of these, uh, the human at the bottom of the pile. And if, and if I can add one thing, not to interrupt you, but no, go uh, for it. One, of, one of the things that I made sure that I wanted to be present in, in the story, um, as you'll read, is who are the first people who are invited to encounter the incarnate Jesus? You know, shepherds. Yeah. Uh, shepherds weren't very high on the totem pole of their society. Um, and so that's why I wanted in our context of writing this one, that the, the first group be migrant workers. You know, um, to give you an idea, when, uh, and this is in the story, when, when you read it, you notice that there's a group of migrant workers working in an orange grove, and they're turning on all the sprinklers because it's extremely cold, everything's gonna freeze over. And so you can imagine the, the chill that these men and women are enduring as they try to save an orange crop that they're hoping to pick so that they can subsist and live. Mm-hmm. And they're tending something, you know, they're caring for something. And watching all of a sudden, exactly, they're watching the oranges by night. Mm-hmm. And, and all of a sudden, you know, this amazing star appears and there's someone who says, you, you're not gonna believe this, but let me tell you what just happened. Mm-hmm. Both of you are following in a very rich tradition of understanding, um, of trying to understand scripture, both the deep and, and eternal truths, and also in our context, mm-hmm. so that, and maybe shaking people up a little bit and, and pushing them to kind of reevaluate the picture and the image that they've had in their minds. Uh, have you had much pushback? Have you had people say, oh, this is, this is not how we should be telling the story? Or, or what have people's responses been to you? Would you like to go first, Alex? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll say that um, you know, I've shared this story with, you know, my congregation here, uh, and um, I've shared it with, with a few people. 
And <clears throat> I haven't gotten a significant amount of, of pushback. I have gotten a good amount of, oh, <clears throat> oh, you know, kind of that, that reaction. Um, because one of the things I mentioned in the story is I'm not trying to rewrite the story. I'm not trying to, um, to replace scripture. Scripture is irreplaceable. Right. Mm -hmm. right. um, and, and the story of, of Jesus is told uh, much more eloquently and uh, much more perfectly in the Gospels. Mm -hmm. uh, so I always kind of start off with that. And I always tell people that my goal is just look at it from a different perspective. What is God trying to tell you in your context about what this word that was breathed means to you from so long ago. That's great to hear. Um, I would say my experience mirrors Alex's uh, pretty large positive reception um, mm -hmm. for the image, which originally I just sent to family and friends, but which quickly found its way onto the internet. Um, and, like disproportionately successful to anything else that I've drawn because I'm not a successful artist. But I sort of thought, well, okay, <laughs> this isn't just, you know, coasting on, uh, on my amazing, you know, art chops. It's like the, the power of the message of the gospel behind the illustration and that inspired the illustration is what is speaking to people. And so, yeah, I think far from like uh, being angry or offended to read or see the gospel told in this way, I think even people are hungry for it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we're not dumb and we know the sanitized, sentimentalized version of the Christmas story that we often see. Uh, we, we know that that's missing part of it. And when we, when we see another perspective, like Alex said, we're like, oh, thank you. Like, I didn't even know I was missing this angle on it until I heard it. And, and one of the reasons I was so, I feel so blessed that your image is appearing on, on this pamphlet is because when I first saw it, mm -hmm you know, on the internet, like, like many people, like many people did, it, it just, I had to let it sit there for a minute. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I'm one of those people like, I don't know what to think of that. And mm -hmm. then I began to study the image and I began to go, oh, wow, this is, I mean, so to me, uh, I'm, I love to write, but imagery really hits me where I live. Yeah. And, and so if people are in some way going to associate the story that I'm trying to, to retell with your image, I, I think there's going to be some deep, powerful conversation behind it. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think you were talking earlier about our sort of, um, uh, you know, the social media, Twitter, publicity, forward-facing culture of our world. It's very ADD, um, whereas like Christian art, ideally should be something that is meditated on and, and like you said, sat with for, for an extended period. You know, you look at like, um, like Eastern Orthodox iconography and stuff. It's not just a picture where you look at it and say, oh, cool picture, swipe. Uh, you know, you're supposed to stay there and inhabit the space and think about it for a while. Um, I really kind of like was hoping people would do that with Jose and Maria, which is why I put in all these extra little Easter egg details, you know. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> You know, there's like, pun, like puns and jokes and stuff, but it's like, if people treat this as some kind of where's Waldo, like find the hidden image puzzle, then at least they're going to be looking at it for a little longer. Right. Yeah. What do both of you hope, uh, Everett, you just talked about this and Alex, you have as well, but how do you hope people will respond to this? How do you hope it will um, transform or shift their understanding uh, and their embrace of the Christmas story as we move into Advent? Um, I, I think what I'm, what I'm hoping is that people will read it more than once. Mm -hmm. You know, um, just kind of like what, what Everett was saying, that you got to sit and look at it for a while. I'm, I'm hoping that people will read it, realize it's not very long, and, and, and maybe read it and share it. But w one of the things I, I, I truly sincerely hope is that people will read this without an agenda. Um, to, to, to read this as something that is almost as an act of worship, uh, to say that, you know, uh, you know, that I wrote this because I love Jesus and I want people to know about him in a way that they can understand and relate to. 
um, I didn't write this to do something political. Uh, you know, I didn't write this to make a, 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 some type of social statement. You know, um, if it does, I mean, okay. But uh, I wrote this to demonstrate God's love for us. And so hopefully when people read this and, and, they, and they look at the, the cover and they, and they absorb this, it'll be more than just what's happening in our world right now. Mm -hmm. That they will look at it and say, my goodness, God loved me so much that this happened. That's, beautiful. Yeah, that, that's awesome. That's the most you could hope for. Um, yeah. I would say, I hope that people um, like, we'll pick up the thought experiment where we left off. You can spell out the analogies or you can kind of do a, a Christmas story in a modern setting, but then your own imagination can go off and think, okay, well, what would the Sermon on the Mount look like in a modern setting? What would the woman at the well or the 10 lepers, you know, what would the show trial with Pilate, you know, how, how would all of those things have manifested themselves in our world today? And, uh, just if, if that goes any way towards making the sometimes like strange and very like historically specific stories of the New Testament uh, coalesce into something more recognizable, then then that's awesome. You know, if you like it's a practice I've tried to like, I haven't drawn it, but I use it in my own imagination. Reading the Bible, I sort of think like, oh, OK, well, we don't have anything exactly like this, but this would be kind of like. X, Y, Z, right. you know. And I've, and I've thought of other stories that, that need to be told. And, and one of the, you know, one of the next stories that I really want to, to think about is, is some of the parables that Jesus teaches. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it's some, one of the thing about parables is that Jesus uses images that are local mm -hmm. and around him. You know, I mean, they're, they're right around him and they're contextual for people. So uh, when we, you know, we do Bible studies here at the parish all the time and, and, I'll tell people, you know, if Jesus was here today, he wouldn't be using seeds and, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. I mean, most people wouldn't get that because they're not in an agricultural society. Yeah. So what would he use? And, and you know, and I do have, uh, you know, some ideas I want to share with, you know, with, uh, with Forward Movement and with you as well uh, about what that looks like. Sounds like there are lots of opportunities for future collaborations. Mm -hmm. I appreciate both of your time, and I really am excited to share with our readers and beyond uh, your retelling the stories of Jesus and particularly the birth of Christ. And uh, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank, thank you, you Rachel. And thank you, Alex. Thank you. Thank you, Everett. Uh, Merry Christmas to you guys. It's a little early. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Merry Christmas. Anything else that I didn't ask that you were hoping to share? Um, uh, Alex? Go ahead, go ahead. Oh, uh, all right. So I didn't have time to get into it in the interview because it's like a little geeky art stuff, like a little more technical about the perspective. You know, there was that question number two, middle-class white people perspective. Uh -huh. So I'll just throw this in. And if there's a place to stitch it in, then fine. Uh, if it's too long, you leave it out. Um, but this was what I was thinking when I was drawing it, going back again to um, medieval art. So perspective in art is a way of using geometry to convey three-dimensional space on a two-dimensional piece of paper. Uh, if you picture like a drawing of railroad tracks where the tracks, even though they're parallel, seem to vanish onto a point on the horizon. Um, you know, by using that kind of geometry, you can create these like buildings where it feels like you're in there and you inhabit uh, three-dimensional space. Um, medieval artists hadn't figured this out yet, or it was still like an ongoing process of figuring out how to draw perspective, which is why in a lot of that art, um, things kind of look a little wonky, buildings seem too small or too large, um, characters don't seem like they have their feet planted firmly on the ground, and everything just kind of floats in front of each other in layers. And because I was doing a nod with the halos and everything to medieval art, I wanted to think, how am I going to mimic that kind of flat, flattened out appearance, you know, while still drawing in a modern style? So the vanishing points, the, the geometric points that I use to create the perspective are really far apart. Um, 
it would be the equivalent in photography of using a telephoto lens instead of a wide angle lens. Mm -hmm. And so the perspective is positioned so that you, the viewer of the image, rather than being uh, like there on the sidewalk with Joseph and Mary, are across the street, maybe. Mm -hmm. Like you're far enough away and you're looking at this, maybe from your car, maybe from the cafe on the other side of the street. Um, but the point is like, the image is seen as if you're not part of the scene, but mm -hmm. that then is leaving, you know, interpretively, now you're looking at the image and you're thinking, what am I doing about all this? I'm over on the other side of the street. I'm looking at right. these people sit standing in the rain. And so it was kind of a, it worked out as a happy accident that the, just the geometry of the perspective created this kind of like, like the person viewing the image is implicitly better off than the people in the image, you know, because they're further away. Yeah. yeah. Now I'm going to have to go back and look at this thing for another half hour. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I was just looking at it while he was explaining it. So, Alex, is there anything that you wanted to add? Um, I think one of the things uh, that's, I, I think, coming back to it as, as we're entering this season of, of Advent is for people to use this as an opportunity to explore deeper that it's a whole season. It is not just a singular event. I mean, you, there's the singular event of Christ coming into the world, but there's so much more that's gonna take place after that. And that's why I love the liturgical calendar that we use. I love how this is gonna lead into, you know, Epiphany and then Lent and then Holy Week and Easter. And, and just to, to not let this be an end point, but rather a, a starting point mm -hmm. for people to begin that discussion and, and go home discuss this with your children, with your family, what does it mean? And then go to church and discuss it too. Great. Well, thank you both. And as Alex mentioned, and Everett, I, I hope that we can talk um, more about this. We are hopeful to have uh, a series or at least several um, of these and would like to um, talk with you about doing the illustrations based on Alex's stories and that type of thing. That's not something for us to figure out today, but I just wanted to plant the seed and hope that oh, we yeah, continue, sure, the, can continue yeah. the collaboration. I think that it's, um, I think there's something really special happening here and mm -hmm. I'm grateful for both of you. Thank you. And we're very appreciative of forward movement. Yeah. Thanks so much, Michelle.